Hi, and welcome to another Defiant special deep, 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 deep dive. And today we're talking about Solana, the high speed, high throughput proof of stake chain that has been on an inexorable climb up the bafflingly misleading leaderboard that is market cap ranking. And if you want to know why it's baffling, just look where Doge is. So what is Solana all about? Why should we be taking notice of it? And why do so many people seem to hate alternative layer ones so much? All that coming up and zagging where others zig. This is The Defiant. We begin in the fashion that has become our trademark by conceding the floor to our sponsors, without whom the world will be less sponsored. And we start with Balancer, who are up to some pretty funky stuff to help ease the pain of high gas costs on Ethereum. Trade as much as you like and recoup most of the gas costs damn straight. And in their new Baal for Gas campaign, traders are receiving six figures worth of Baal tokens every week. And with version 2 just around the corner, Balancer is becoming a one-stop shop for DeFi liquidity. Version 2 brings stable pools and weighted pools tightly integrated under a single protocol with flash loans, lending via asset managers, and much, much more. Check it out at balancer.finance. Now we move to Ava, which I keep calling Ava, but it's Ava. Fun fact, the name is actually taken from the Finnish word for ghost. And it's a decentralized open source and non-custodial liquidity protocol on Ethereum. Depositors earn interest by providing liquidity to lending pools while borrowers can obtain loans by tapping into these pools with variable and stable interest rate options. Deposit into Arva protocol and receive A tokens, which accrue interest every second right in your wallet. Seriously, you can actually watch your balance going up every single second. Swap any of your deposited assets at any time to get the best yields on the market. For the developers out there, Arva features access to DeFi building blocks like flash loans and credit delegation. Arva protocol liquidity pools are now available on Ethereum and sidechain Polygon. To begin our journey, we have to journey back to June 2018 when an aggressive layer one scaling solution launched what was really an all out assault on well, pretty much everybody. It proclaimed itself the ETH killer. It raised $4 billion over the course of a year-long ICO, of which $24 million went straight into the pockets of the SEC. I am, of course, talking about EOS. Now, whether you consider EOS a success or a failure, and given the amount they raised, how can we consider it anything other than a colossal cluster What was that? Oh. I can't have an opinion about that. Oh, okay. Sorry. The uh, Bureau of Objective Journalism is keeping close tabs on me now. And, um, so yes, EOS didn't quite meet expectations. Somehow though, this colossal fundraise signaled to the rest of the market that the ETH killer narrative made sense. And what followed was a seemingly never-ending procession of like-minded killers, all of which made the same assumption. Given slow transaction speeds and high costs, developers as rational actors would naturally defect to whichever platform offered the best conditions in which to build. An assumption which has been proven to be completely incorrect. Not only that, it has served to wind up Ethereum developers no end. Now it used to be that there were Bitcoin maximalists and shitcoiners, but now we also have ETH maximalists who treat competing layer ones with the same deep-rooted disdain as their Bitcoin counterparts. And maybe they have good reason to, because for the most part, the so-called ETH killers have fared less well than the hype around them might have led you to expect. I should know, I used to work for one. Now in their Q1 report, Outlier Ventures noted the decline in developer activity on Tron, EOS, Komodo, and Qtum, although the last two I don't recall ever having been called ETH killers, but hey, you know, what do I know? Now, they also identified that developers were now actively choosing to pour their time into DeFi protocols built on Ethereum instead, or into multi-chain beasts like Polkadot. So yeah, it's all DeFi's fault. Now, that same report gave but two very short mentions to Solana, but Mike Novogratz, of all people, was recently moved to call it a good horse to ride. Giddy up, Mike. <laughs> We have 
So what is Solana and what are they doing right? Well, to help me get to the heart of the matter, I spoke to Raj Gokul, Solana's COO, and threw him some deliberately Maxi-style questions. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to record any voice messages for me because, well, he's just damn, too damn busy. But I will pepper his responses throughout as they're refreshingly honest and free from marketing speak. So let's start with what Solana actually is. So Solana is a proof-of-stake blockchain whose big ambition was to configure a network of decentralized nodes so immaculately that they would match the performance of a single node. Now there are a bunch of powerful components to their system like Proof of History, Tower BFT, and Gulfstream, their mempool-less transaction forwarding protocol. Way too much to go into here. But the Tower consensus mechanism basically leverages proof of history as a global source of time before consensus is achieved, and this massively reduces network latency. Proof of history uses a recursive verifiable delay function to hash incoming events and transactions. This also makes it extremely fast. Now, it's a bit 2017 to throw TPS numbers around, but 60,000 is the one normally most often quoted in the bump about Solana. And don't you just love the word bump? ETH 2.0 is designed to leverage the parallel processing of shards. And I was fortunate to work at Harmony and see firsthand how sharded systems function. Now, while I was there, the team managed to lower the block time from 10 seconds to two seconds, which is fast. But it is telling that Solana measure their block time not in seconds, but in milliseconds. Now, there are a few problems inherent with shards, not least of which is ensuring that they can all communicate with each other, that they can stay in sync. Now, to avoid this, core developer activity tends to cluster on the same shard, leaving the others vulnerable to being taken over. And that composability we all love in DeFi becomes immeasurably more difficult once sharding is introduced. But that is the way ETH2 is headed. So, obviously, many bright minds have started attacking the problem. Some within Ethereum, and many more externally attempting to deliver the architecture of ETH 2.0, but better and faster, hoping that will be enough to attract developers whose firepower is essential to any emerging young chain. Others, however, decided to forge a different path, building the trade-offs that made the most sense to them. Cosmos, Polkadot, Solana, for instance, now, being EVM compatible was always held as a crucial USP for layer ones, but turns out maybe it wasn't that important after all. Or maybe the only team that could actually pull it off were the ones with their own network and user base ready to come and play. Binance. But hey, look, if you really want to make this easy, it's this. Solana is a smart contract platform that's designed to be orders of magnitude faster and cheaper than Ethereum. And that's it. And is it? Well, yes it is. But that's really just the start of the journey. My focus has been on the DeFi ecosystem, which is being rapidly built out on Solana. But there has been an impressive eruption of investment, projects porting over to Solana, Solstarter has been the talk of the town thanks to its promise of fairer IDOs and token launches, and then we have the likes of Star Atlas, which promises a rich game metaverse complete with NFTs and in-game economy that can be translated into real-world income. And to be honest, their new Meta posters do look pretty cool. But let's zero in on the DeFi system because this is the defiant after all. Now to begin with, what you need for DeFi is stable coins, preferably ones that are well supported and recognizable. Both USDC and USDT exist natively on Solana now, which is quite a rarity. And given how rapidly Visa is rolling out support for USDC as a settlement option for blockchain, this is an important stable to have running on the network. They've also built a cross-chain bridge to enable the transit of assets from Ethereum. It's called the wormhole. And this is more complicated than it might be on other platforms that are EVM compatible, but it should be becoming clearer by the day that a multi-chain future is coming our way fast. So in the future, expect Ren, Phantom, and Terra, and more on that last one in a bit. Now, look, every crypto project, or every successful crypto project, needs a good front man someone to be the brand's storyteller and the beating heart. The last one playing the violin as the ship goes down. Think Vitalik, think Charles H. Bomb Hoskinson, or Dan Larimer. Oh, come on! Who wrote this? Dan Larimer, seriously? Now this hero of heroes normally comes from within. But over the last year, a young man with fabulous hair and apparently even more fabulous bank account 
has established himself as the unofficial poster child for Solana. I am, of course, talking about SBF. Sam Bankman Free. Sam Bankman Free. Fri Anyone? Sam Bankman. Sam Bankman. Sam manages around many billions and billions and billions worth of assets through Alameda Research, and he became a folk hero to the sushi swap community when he steered the project through the potentially calamitous Chef Nomi situation. Oh, Sam. Sam is the CEO of the FTX exchange, and out of these two entities has emerged Serum. You have to say it in a certain way for it to really land. Serum which is the world's first decentralized derivatives exchange, which also features an AMM in the shape of Serum Swap. And Serum is where things get interesting. Now, as you would expect given the rise of DeFi, there are actually a bunch of Uniswap-style AMMs built on Solana, like Bonfida, Radium, and Orca. But there's one crucial difference between the ones you find here and the ones you find on Ethereum. It's clobbering time. That's right, Serum, Serum, uses a clob. That's right, a clob. And what is a clob? Well, it's a central limit order book, much like you'd find on a centralized exchange. But unlike those centralized exchanges, any project in the Solana ecosystem can access the clob and plug in their liquidity, as well as accessing the monster liquidity provided by Alameda and legendary market makers jump trading. This is exactly what Radium did. So successfully, in fact, that Serum Swap has now been deprecated, allowing users to move to the focus competitor in Radium. As SBF himself wrote, Radium protocol outbuilt and outcompeted Serum Swap, and the ecosystem wins to it. Well done, Radium. Now, this is actually also a win for Serum since Radium is driving its volume through the SRM order books. Now, Radium also recently launched incentivized fusion pools, which are joint projects between Radium and Serum ecosystem partners, paying out dual yield in both the platform's native token and the other asset in a given fusion pool. This provides honest farmers with a way to increase their exposure to two Solana tokens at the same time. Now, it seems to be a recurring theme of the Solana DeFi ecosystem, projects complementing, not competing. Very wholesome. The thing is, all the recent headlines around Solana seem to be fixated on SBF. Do you remember that quote from Mike Novogratz? Betting on the ecosystems of SBF and Do Kwan has been a great investing strategy. And I was curious how the Solana team themselves felt about this. Last year, he was the loudest, most credible builder who shouted from the mountaintops about Solana to give it the awareness it deserves, because he seems to care about the space progressing and using next-gen infrastructure. Ultimately, every successful network needs many owners, contributors, and more importantly, champions. Network champions can help evolve the ecosystem in ways that individual builders can't. Joe Lubin and Mike Novogratz were pivotal in being champions in their own way. SBF is one such awesome champion for Solana in an ever-growing ecosystem. Things move quickly. There are 18,000 developers in the Discord and 3 plus million followers across other channels. The community is already much bigger than SBF at this point. By nature it will only increasingly diversify from SBF. We are grateful for SBF's support in the early days, and his help in producing Serum which will be a flagship Solana dApp for years to come. But in the long run, Serum will be one of many globally distributed projects on the Solana network. Do you remember your first DeFi transaction? After juggling five or more tabs on your browser, you gazed at that Etherscan confirmation, feeling like you just contributed to the future of finance, except no, you kind of just got a little bit lost. In a world of gas prices, vaults, pools, hard forks, degenerates, and sushi chefs, and all that malarkey. Fortunately, Zerion has built the dream tool for managing your portfolio. Track all of your token balances across wallets and chains, access every kind of DeFi asset, including indexes, pools, and yield strategies, and trade at the cheapest rates with no extra fees. And that is because Zerion sources liquidity from every single decentralized exchange, like Uniswap, ZeroX, and OneInch. No sign-up required, no fees, and a blissfully easy UI. Simply connect your wallet at app, .zerion.io. And that does it for the sponsors. 
So I mentioned Terra earlier, and if you follow the channel for a while, you know that we've done a fair few videos on their DeFi ecosystem of late, mainly because it's so heavily focused on DeFi, and they're already connected with Solana. Now the plan is to introduce Sol's staking rewards as fuel in Anchor's money markets. Terra's stablecoin UST is already live on Solana, and it is clear that there's huge admiration between the projects, although the relative incompatibility of the two chains has raised some problems. Doe has been an ally and fierce advocate for Solana, and unfortunately all of his big ambitious ideas have been blocked by Wormhole being incompatible with Terra. This will change soon. Now they actually announced a low latency bridge between the projects a year ago now, but if they can get this working, it opens up a hugely impressive DeFi ecosystem for Solana projects, and if Terra, well then who else? This year has clearly proven that we are heading for a multi-chain future. Some users are willing to trade off security for better UX, e.g. Flow, BSC. Some users will always be anchored to maximum security, POW, Ethereum. There are different flavors of blockchain-based environments being created for all types of users, and bridges being built to connect all of these ecosystems. In our opinion, it now seems infeasible to expect that everyone will consolidate to one network. One of the biggest sticks in the arsenal of any maximalist is decentralization. It is the stick that must regularly be used to beat competing L1s into submission. The truth is, it takes quite a long time to become decentralized, and it is something of a sliding scale. You aren't just decentralized or not decentralized, you're more decentralized. But we can do a kind of very rough comparison of various chains here by looking at how many nodes there are in the network. So the first place to look when thinking about node distribution is, of course, Bitcoin. And we go to bitnodes.io, and here we find 9,760 nodes, which is a lot. And if we look at the live map, you can see there's a huge concentration in North America and in Europe, but not so, not so much towards China, a little bit on Australia. And it's kind of surprising because in my mind, I feel like there'd be more nodes in China, but I suspect what's going on here is there's just a lot of mining power in China, but not so many nodes. Germany, 1,784. Them Germans love that Bitcoin. So that is quite impressive, but obviously Bitcoin's been around a long time now. So you'd expect that a successful chain would have been able to decentralize itself to a considerable degree. Let's look at Ether, or Ethereum as they like to call it. The kids like to call it Ethereum. So if we go to Ether nodes, we can see that there are in total 3,958 clients here. And if we look at the countries, again, it's quite heavily concentrated in the US, Germany. And you look at the map, Europe, almost nothing in Africa, South America, Asia. So even if we think about there being lots of nodes, the node power is still heavily concentrated in specific territories around the world. If we really want a decentralized network that's global, you kind of want more of a spread than that. And I'm sure it will come. But this idea of decentralization and how things are spread out sometimes looks a little different when you look at it geographically like this. Next, I'm going to look at, oh, let's look at Algorand. So Algorand have two different types of nodes. They have participation nodes and relay nodes. The relay nodes are probably the most important one. And if we look at their FAQs, where is it? It's somewhere down here. How many relay nodes are there? As of January 2021, there is just over 100 relay nodes. And who's running those relay nodes? Algorand Inc, Algorand Foundation, and early backers, including universities and commercial entities. Those are who are running the relay nodes. Does that sound decentralized? Not really. Probably means that the chain is quite fast and performant, but decentralized? Yeah, um, okay. So what about Hashgraph? Hashgraph loves to talk about how they're great for enterprise blockchain. On the 7th of January 2021, they released a press uh, piece saying, very excited to announce today that Hedera has expanded its network from, just hold your excitement here, 14 nodes to, wait for it, 16 nodes, 16. They added two new nodes with the inclusion of Avery Dennison and Dentons into its most recent mainnet update. Um, okay, 
Uh, do we think that's uh, decentralized? No. Well, here is a list of the nodes. And um, as I look at it now, there's 17 of them and two of them have a partial outage. Okay. Okay. It can happen. Now, what about Harmony? So if we look at the Block Explorer and Harmony, we see that there's a two second block latency. Um, I remember when that was 10 seconds. Node count, 1,000. Shard count, four. And it's the node count we're interested in. So 1,000 sounds very impressive, right? If you think that Ethereum has you know, 4,000 or so, Harmony pumping in at you know, 1,000 nodes sounds impressive. But something you do need to know here, which is the vast majority of those nodes are in fact not run by the community. They're not run by external validators. They're in fact internal. And the picture gets a little, little muddier if you go to the validator dashboard and you look at how many validators there actually are. Go down the bottom, ah, it's 105. That's still quite a lot. And many of these validators are taking up more than one slot, uh, but still. That's not, that's not that decentralized, is it? Sorry, Harmony. Uh, now, what about Elrond? Elrond's pretty interesting. Elrond makes lots of big claims about lots of different things. You can see on their validator page, a lot of it is concentrated in Europe. They are a Romanian-based project, so that's what you'd expect. And there are nodes dotted around all over the place. What we're interested in here is how many validators they have. Because it looks like a very impressive number. If you thought Harmony was impressive, this is even more impressive. They have 3,200 active validators, uh, 800 on each shard. And that is, that is deeply impressive, is it not? Uh, but is it? But is it? Because the thing is, if you scroll down, these all look legit, right? If you scroll down, suddenly from 73 onwards, something happens. They all seem to have the same logo. Oh wait, what's this? It's the Elrond logo. What do you mean Elrond is running all of these validators? Yes, I'm afraid that's exactly what's going on here. And one can only assume that the AWS costs of running all those nodes are going to be substantial. So, as impressive as it looks, it's all fluff, I'm afraid. That's not to diminish the achievement of getting even 100 validators, which is bloody hard, by the way, to keep their uptime around 100%. But yeah, the numbers don't tell the whole picture. So now what about Solana? So we go to Solana Beach, which is the best block explorer I could find, the best stats page I could find for Solana. Again, we can see on the map, heavy concentration in uh, the United States, Europe, uh, Germany just seems to be a hotbed for blockchain. And then over here in um, East Asia, nothing particularly unexpected there. How many validators do they have? 601. 601 validators. Now in the context of what we've just seen, 601 should seem pretty impressive. And it is, but do we believe it? Do we believe that these are all external validators? Um, as I understand from having being part of Harmony, there is, it's important to get your decentralized network up and running by running your own nodes initially, but maybe I'm wrong here, but as I scroll down and go through the list, it does appear to me that the vast majority of these nodes are in fact external. That Solana is doing what these other projects are not doing and it's, it's encouraging and managing to succeed in persuading external validators to run software, to run nodes. And running a node is not easy. It requires quite a lot of effort on the part of the validator to do so, running software updates and uh, maintaining uptime. It's not just a plug and play and you know, forget about it. So yeah, like I said, go to a project's website and it will tell you, you know, it'll give you some numbers, but they don't necessarily paint the whole picture. In Solana's case, I think it definitely adds up more favorably than any of the other ones we've ever looked at apart from Ethereum and Bitcoin. So yeah, something to think about. So it turns out Solana stacks up pretty well for a network that's only a year old. A sixth of the nodes of Ethereum with three and a half percent of the market cap. And when I pressed Raj on this, he became understandably prickly. 
The network is a year old. At Genesis, it was around 40 nodes. By January 2021 it was 373. It's 600 now, with testnet at 1k. The testnet validators should onboard to mainnet and get the mainnet to 1k within a month or two. The rate of growth is more valuable than the standalone number today. It's growing from scratch, and for instance Larry Cermak said recently on Twitter he thinks 100k nodes in three years is feasible. He had to stretch that number to 500k before he was willing to take a bet with me on it. One of blockchain's great selling points has always been censorship resistance, and that's why it's so important that the network be as distributed as possible. Balaji coined the term Nakamoto coefficient last year as a way to quantify the decentralization of a blockchain. In his words, it's the number of entities you need to compromise at least one essential subsystem. The higher the number, the better. If you only need to control one entity within a system to compromise an essential part of it, then that's obviously not very secure. Now, Vitalik's last tweet on the subject, which was a few months ago, suggested Ethereum had risen from a Nakamoto coefficient of 25 to 34. So where does Solana sit? Last year Solana's was as low as 3 to 4, with Solana run nodes in the super minority. Now there are no Solana run nodes in the super minority, virtually all nodes are independently run, and the Nakamoto coefficient is 15. It's trending upward, and there are projects like stake pools rolling out to flatten the distribution and get the NC up. So what about this EVM compatibility issues? Now, one of the big decisions Solana took was not to be EVM compatible out of the gate, while many of their competitors made this a core promise. I guess ostensibly to make it easier for Solidity developers to join the party. And as a result, Solana's architecture should be much better optimized to meet the needs of their design system. But it does mean developers have to do a bit more work to learn the necessary skills to build there. But this seems to be having an unexpected benefit in filtering out fair weather developers, in other words, filtering out the slightly less good ones. Not only that, EVM compatibility is in fact already being built by the community. There are at least two community-driven projects actively in motion, an EVM rollup on Solana and a Solidity transpiler that compiles to bytecode. It's inevitable, it just wasn't prioritized early on by the community. As far as holding Solana's adoption back, maybe in raw numbers. But we've found that the devs willing to take two weeks to learn Rust and build from scratch have been very high quality. That's very important in the early days. And long term, we expect that Web2 languages like Rust will actually end up being bridges for traditional developers to get into blockchain development. So where does that leave us? Well, okay, I'm going to go on a bit of a rant here and stick my hand up because I'm going to register some bias here. I'm rooting for Solana. Having worked for a layer one myself, I do understand how hard it is to build and sustain a network of decentralized nodes while constantly under attack both from outside and from inside. It's not just maxis or other projects, it's token holders as well who can be terrifying in their swiftness to judge and condemn. Now, I've always enjoyed my interactions with the team at Solana, but you should judge the project by whichever criteria best suits you. And I guess I'm just rooting for any project that adds value to the space, wherever they are, whatever they're building. Now at the weekend, I declared myself hardwired to be anti-maximalist on Twitter, which prompted David Hoffman of Bankless to respond like this. Hardwired to be anti-maximalist is similar to saying, I'm chained agnostic, which is similar to saying, I'm values agnostic. It's not a choice you can responsibly opt out of, in my opinion. Which got me thinking. You see, I find maximalism a troubling position to take for a few reasons. I find it tends to promote navel-gazing, leading to the assumption that innovation is only valid if it comes from within. And it also tends to instill a mentality that the answer to all answers has been found, or in other words, one ring to rule them all. And this can quickly lead to xenophobia, refusing to countenance the existence of others, or worse, attacking them. Here I will plant my flag, put down roots and make my home. And that just feels like a very defensive position to be taking when everything is moving forward so fast. Digging in is acting against innovation, just my opinion. Now, In his tweet, David equated being anti-maximalist with being chain agnostic. 
it's not a choice you can responsibly opt out of, but I kind of feel he's missing the point here. For me, being anti-maximalist means opting into all choices without prejudice. Now, modern society is becoming defined more and more by fluidity of gender, of identity, nationality, politics, everything really. Who I am in the morning may well bear little resemblance to who I am in the afternoon. The great qualitative marketer Wendy Gordon used to call this fractal consumerism. Now, at its worst, maximalism is a form of censorship. Just look at Reddit. If there's one thing we can hope to gain from crypto, it's freedom of choice, to go wherever suits us best. Liquidity dominates the conversation in DeFi. Liquidity is naturally fluid and money will go wherever it damn pleases. Now I cannot speak for you, but if there's one thing I've learned the last four years, it's that my own biases, my own prejudices, invariably get in the way. Maximalism imposes filter bubbles and rejects opposing opinions by shouting them down. Now I think we owe it to ourselves to challenge our own assumptions on a daily basis. And in response to David, if I feel any responsibility, it's certainly not to you. It's to stand behind the preservation of critical thinking and to be open to great ideas wherever they may be. From my point of view, Solana are building an impressive body of work in this space. What sets them apart for me is their resolution to do it their own way. They're plugging in the best talent available and the market is clearly responding. Personally, I can't wait to see where they go next because this is not a zero-sum game. If they win, we all win. And that's an idea that seems to be baked beautifully into their entire DeFi ecosystem. Staring brightly at the sun with the most non-judgmental shades I could find, this was The Defiant.